you probably remember something that the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges wrote once that every book in the world is just a page in a gigantic, enormous book that humankind is writing along its history. And that's true, I think, because books are a continuity. They have uh, parents and offsprings. Every book has an origin, and sometimes, not all books have offsprings, but sometimes books generate a progeny. And this is the case of this book that I am presenting to you in this clip. This one, it here, Limits and Beyond, which is a revisitation of a book that was written 50 years ago, which you may have heard of, The Limits to Growth, written in 1972 by a team of researchers of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which was important enough um, it left a progeny, an uh, offspring, so important that we are still discussing this book 50 years later. This year, 2022, marks the 50th anniversary of the publication of this book. So, why are we still discussing this book that incidentally so many people said it is wrong, it is not good, it is horrible, it is all a fake. Mm, well, because the very fact that so many people hated this book means that I was saying something important, very important, still relevant to us. 50 years later, not for nothing, we wrote this book. Um, together with several other authors, myself and Carlos Alvarez Pereira is my co-editor. So I'd like to tell you what this book was about. Why it's so important? Well, you see, the story is that uh, we live in a complex world, surrounded by many, many, many things. And, uh, you know, our ancestors were not equipped to deal with such a things like, like the complexity of the modern world. The people, cities, uh, the economy, the mass media, the climate system, uh, the resources, the um, exploitation and depletion. You have so many things. That is difficult for a um, simple human mind like mine and yours. I imagine you are humans <laughs> listening to me right now. Um, it's difficult to grasp the whole thing. Very difficult. You see, our mind was probably born for hunters and gatherers. So you had to be, you were in the forest you had to see what is that? Is it an antelope and, or maybe a saber toothed tiger? You had to extract the signal out of the background, even if you're looking for berries, so it is red, it is a berry, I can eat it. But this gives us a limited view. When we discuss the future of humankind, everybody, people, scientists, politicians, uh, decision makers, whatever you have, most of them uh, will tell you, well, the problem is overpopulation, the problem is immigration. Problem is government debt. Problem is communism. Problem is whatever. But it, you may imagine that in a complex world like the one in which we live, the problems are also complex. So there comes the idea. Let's try to help this poor human brain, which is so stressed by trying to keep into account so many things that you help it with a computer. Definition of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is very fashionable nowadays, as you know, you have to take it with great caution because artificial intelligence is tricky. Sometimes people say artificial stupidity, which is also correct in many cases, but depends. You have to keep control, but artificial intelligence can be very useful to you to help your brain take into account all the parameters of a complex system without being 
led astray by your personal preferences, like by your political ideas, by your moral feelings. So we use a computer to help you. Okay, all the parameters are input in the program. The program manages the beta comes out with an with an output. No uh, personal inference. The result is this. This is what they did. 20, 50 years ago. 50 years ago they modeled the whole world using a, techn a technology, a modeling technology which had been invented in the, that period. In the 1960s was the period of, uh, when artificial intelligence at the time was called more commonly uh, cybernetics started being fashionable, difficult to do, but anyway, it depends what are your purposes. You don't mean to create artificial intelligence, you don't create artificial human beings. No, we, we are not, not able to do that, not even today, but, but if it is question to help humans to manage complex systems, then that was possible already 50 years ago. It's, it, it is still now, we have much better computers, but the idea is still the same. We take the system, we define the parameters, we build a model in which the parameters um, connect with each other, each parameter affects all the parameters, things change. We don't look at that as human beings, we let the computer deal with this interaction, say, what's, what's happening? Uh, you just calculate, this grows, the other one goes down, one goes up, and then, and then see what the system does. And uh, that was a big, a very big progress of science in 1972. Uh, we can still say, I think personally, that this is the book that characterizes the 20th century. There was no book, I think, so influential as this one. But maybe you can discuss that, in my opinion. And so what was the result? The result you probably know, you have heard that this book was a catastrophistic book that um, uh, supposed that everything was to collapse, that we are all die, going to die, and these kind of things. You probably have seen this graph in one version or another, where you see these curves, these bell-shaped curves, you see, like this one, t-shirt, they are similar to this one, I call them the Seneca effect, but, but really it is, it is a way, typical way, in which complex systems behave. A complex system, like a book, is alive, it consumes resources, builds up structures, and uh, if, when it is, it runs out of resources, then you go up and then you go down. That's uh, the ancient philosopher like uh, Seneca, the Roman philosopher, Seneca 2000 years ago, noted that, well, okay, things go up and then go down, and usually they go down faster than they go up. And this is a problem. This is what you call collapse. And then you have catastrophe, and then you call catastrophists. And then you don't like that, and you say, oh, this book is bad, it's all wrong, and people have been saying that for more or less 50 years. Not everybody, fortunately. Some people recognized, okay, look, it's not so bad as some people say, because it is not a prophecy. Surely not a prophecy of doom. It is not a political program, it is not a re religious revelation, not at all, it is simply a calculation. Calculation telling you, okay, you do certain things, the results are maybe not pleasant, as in the, in the figures that I show to you, because if you keep using the resources of the planet, and you keep growing in terms of population, in terms of production, in terms of um, making things and cultivating the land and then and, and cutting forests and all what you, people do to attain what they call economic growth, then you eventually run out, but it is not that you stop, you go down, you collapse, and that's what the program said. And when would that happen? 
more or less now which i think we cannot say we are not yet really collapsing but i think you may agree with me that if we look around what's happening then good probabilities we can maintain that going down not yet very fast but we could be going down fast in the near future collapse okay that's more or less the whole story there is not much more to that it is a evaluation of some parameters and it says the book says you keep doing what you've been doing up to now in 1972 then you go up a little more and then you go down you collapse and that's what maybe what's happening but we are not slave what a computer says we think with our minds as well, how can we avoid collapse and already in 1972 the authors were sketching ways to avoid the collapse and the main point they said okay there's only one point that one of the authors the famous uh, lady donella meadows she said well the problem is one growth if you keep growing if you want to keep growing you eventually because there is, you grow on even if you grow on renewable resources you cannot keep growing forever at some point you must return to the level that the available resources will actually support nothing this is not doesn't require artificial intelligence it's just simple logic you have a certain amount of resources you can get out of the resources a certain flow of resources that you use and then that's uh, that's your limit because the resources are not infinite so where do we stand now we stand in a point that uh, in a difficult situation because we are using mainly fossil fuels fossil fuels are first of all not infinite we are gradually not right now we're not running out of, of anything right now but gradually we are but now there is a big problem of pollution coming from fossil fuels pollution that we call and we see mainly in the form of climate change is very 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 bad for everybody not as or even that will not happen tomorrow not next year maybe not even in 10 years but but uh, it is coming and the book didn't didn't have climate change as a parameter they knew what it was but it was not known as well as it is now but they they used a general parameter which was called pollution pollution includes today what we recognize as climate change so how do we do it how do we avoid collapsing very simple we must get rid of fossil fuels no doubt about that then we recycle we try to pollute less but in a complex system you still need energy you cannot do anything without energy we have, to have been doing so far so well I mean, we've been growing gigantically because we had energy from fossil fuels now if we remove fossil fuels from the system then you will die <laughs> no way avoid that and so um we have to do and fortunately we have today um, resources technologies that back in 1972 we didn't have like renewable have renewable now they have been growing extremely fast over the past just few years the world has changed like this from renewable being a toy for environments is now they are a real technology that can produce energy at a very reasonable cost provided you want to invest some money in them and if we invest in renewable technology we have to keep into account that nevertheless even though renewables are now cheap, nevertheless, they are not infinite, They're just like oil. But they can keep us alive and well, and even prosperous, if we recognize that we cannot grow forever. We stabilize, which is the message. That's the message. The message is if you keep producing energy and you stabilize the economy, then you can be happy and keep going humankind for a long time centuries millennia millions of years well, that's a little bit difficult but we don't worry so much 
about millions of years, but we have to stabilize the system, which, by the way, is also stabilize the climate, solve the problem. So that's the message, and uh, this book that you see there tells you the whole story. Story of the first book, how it was understood, how it was acted upon, what effects it had on the way of thinking of people, which had some effect, even though people denied that they, they, they had read it, but it had. And I want from now on how we can use the same methods, the same ideas, the same um, concepts to help us face an uncertain future, which will not be necessarily bad. If we manage well what we have, the perspectives, I think, they are bright. No catastrophe, no collapse. Just remember what this book taught us back 50 years ago. And thanks a lot for your attention.